Mr. Groves, it's been too long, my friend. Has it? I feel like it was yes. just yesterday. Oh, well, yeah, there is that aspect to it, isn't it? <laughs> just good friends get together. And I see Mr. Kane. Julie, good to see you. Hey, Dan, how are you? So, Where's Dan, Matt? I'm Dan, I'm seeing uh, Drew Robbins on here. And I don't know if it's the same one, but I used to know a uh, Drew Robbins. No, not the same one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 do you get mistaken for a, a different Drew Robbins from time to time? Um, no. No? It's the first seven, yeah. Okay. There's a Drew Robbins who used to work. I think he still does work for Microsoft, but he was, I think he was from where I am, Columbus, Ohio. And he eventually moved out to Japan, I think. But he was like one of the first developer evangelists, developer advocates I ever met, like a long, long time ago. So, well, there you go. Now you're meeting people out in space. Yeah, I'm actually uh, really proud of this right here. This is my new retractable uh, green screen, and I uh, got two of those installed. Uh, you know the being in a house with living in a house with five women you just don't have any space so the best i can do is put a green screen down there and hope that you know because in the past you never know what state of undress somebody was walking by behind you so you know you had to <laughs> gotta have some kind of control for that kind of stuff this is the world in 2021 this is the world in 2021 i'm sure that all y'all so uh, let's get rolling here just a couple things going on. Uh, I'm sure all y'all in the same spot, you know, my, my business, my company's trying to figure out what to do. Like when can we back, get back to the office? Should we get back to the office? What are the, um, what are the switches and things that you would look at and say, well, that's, that's a good idea. So they're trying to figure out how to do that right now. And they're, they're talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. And if we know nothing else about the way that things have been going lately, I've just stopped making bets, you know, DevOps Days, DevOps Days Houston. We're planning on doing it. We're planning on going live in person in September, live and in person, everybody getting together. So that that's the plan right now, because why not? You know, it, it's weirder things have happened, right? So the plan is right now to get together and do the conference, a two-day conference the way we always have. We're looking forward to that. In the meantime, DevOps uh, Meetup has been meeting virtually, and I'm trying to figure out, well, when... When are we going to try to do like a live and in-person meetup? I'm noticing that when you do live and in-person things, there's quite a few people that want to come out and do it. They, you know, want to get back to uh, back to actually seeing people in person. So many, so many Zoom sessions you can do before you're zoomed out. So uh, a lot of that, a lot of that's kind of stuff happening. We're talking a lot about um, the drivers of whether or not you go back to the office. I was talking about my, with my boss about this thing. My boss is the CIO at uh, ABS there. And we were talking about that. And I was thinking, you know, like we've got a couple of big initiatives. And when you have a creative endeavor, when you need to, when you need to have a lot of dynamic conversations and stuff like that, boy, that's when it helps to be able to get everybody into a room, into a nice big whiteboard, and you can argue and, and hit each other with pool noodles and whatever you need to do in order to come to a good solution, right? In those creative endeavors. But if you're going to be, if you're going to be just executing uh, and trying to be as efficient as possible, there's something to be said for working from home. Uh, you know, that that's where people are in their element. They're able to plan better. They don't have to deal with traffic. They can work longer hours if they need to. So there's all of these kind of conversations where like, well, do we think the business is in a disruptive cycle? Do we think that we really should be pushing forward on technology or is this more about execution? And when you look at uh, what's happening on the, the global uh, marketplace and the global economy, People, it's like everybody put the pause on in 2020, right? And they, okay, hold on here. We're not sure about what's going to happen. Now, all of that stuff that was put on pause, people are like, well, let's come on, let's get back to it. And so we're seeing just this swell of uh, work that's coming our way. And so we're going to be, uh, like my dad used to say, busier and cats covering poop on a marble floor, trying to just get through the rest of the year. It's not really about innovation as much about just getting the work done that we need to get done because everybody had paused and now they're like, they're, they're 
double double loading us on uh, things we need to do. So a lot of interesting conversations around that. And of course, you know, planning on where DevOps is going to uh, be making an inroad in ABS. We've got a lot of conversations around that. So all that being said, I see some familiar faces. I see some new faces. Thank you everybody for jumping on. We had about 40, I think 41 people that uh, threatened to show up. So um, we'll see see who winds up making it. If, uh, if I could uh, beg you to turn on your cameras, we'll get a couple of nice screenshots so that we can uh, uh, have a nice splash thing for the video that when we post that. So if you have a camera, go ahead and turn that sucker on. And smile. Look at those beautiful people. Wow. And one more. And smile. You know, you got to have content. So let's go ahead and get started here. Let's talk a little bit about um, the Houston DevOps meetup. So what are we doing here? Why are we... Uh, What's the Houston DevOps meetup about and what do we do? Well, the Houston DevOps meetup is about community. It's literally that simple. We, um, when you look at what's going on with development, it, it's, in a, it's in a disruptive cycle. Uh, there's a lot happening in development. I was uh, doing a presentation on DevOps today for my, um, my coworkers. And boy, if you go to cncf.io, there is, oh no, there's Russell DePena. I know that guy. There is a, uh, just, you go to cncf.io, there's just all of these things, all these options. It's like this deluge of uh, creativity and, and things happening. So you need a little bit of work. You need a little bit of help. You need a network. You need to know people. And that's what the Houston DevOps Meetup is about. It's about connecting the professionals in, I, in uh, Houston and IT so that if they don't know necessarily how to do this or that, if they need an expert, for instance, in something like AWS, well, they can talk to Russell and he'll well, hook them up. You know, he knows what to do in that area. If they need an expert in something that's going to be, you know, that's something outside of their normal uh purview well this is the place that you develop that network and you and you find people that you can uh, you can work with so that's what we're about we're about building that community and building the uh, IT professional in Houston because uh, Houston has a lot of people it's got a diverse footprint and we have some enormous tasks and problems that we're trying to tackle here in Houston and we're going to do it we're going to figure out how to do it because that's what Houston does. We solve problems. So the Houston DevOps meetup does that kind of thing. So we meet every month, typically once a month at the end of the month. Sometimes we do off cycle, but this, uh, this presentation is almost like a part two. We had talked with Matt uh, previously and he wanted to come back and do another presentation. I thought, well, SQL plus plus, I don't even know what that is. So I'm looking forward to this presentation. I hope you are as well. And so who are you going to be presenting, Matt? Should I make you presenter? Yeah, sure. Okay. I can do that. I figured out how to do this. <laughs> uh, where are you? Where are you? Here. Okay. You should have ability. All right. I think we're good there. So hopefully you can all see my title slide here. Okay. And uh, speaking of disruption, uh, this is going to be a topic that is both disruptive and sort of not disruptive. It's uh, kind of best of both worlds, I think. Uh, we're going to talk about SQL++ for big data. Uh, same language, but more power. That's kind of the SQL++. That's uh, you, Hopefully, you've all at least heard of SQL. Probably many of you use it at, at least uh, every, every once in a while. Uh, if you're like me, you use it on a daily basis. Um, so what, what exactly would SQL++ entail and how does it help with big data? So, um, you know, this is uh, the Stack Overflow uh, developer survey from 2020 showing the top languages. And you can see that SQL is right up there amongst JavaScript and HTML as kind of like that tier one lingua franca category. Um, it's like, you know, Python, Java, C Sharp, they're all popular, but there's a whole second level when you get to SQL, HTML, and JavaScript because it's just ubiquitous across all kinds of uh, different applications. So SQL rules data. I think uh, I'm, I'm fairly uh, safe in saying that. I don't think that's too controversial, 
uh, what's with all this NoSQL stuff then? You know, I work for Couchbase. We have a, a, a NoSQL database. And what's, what's with all this stuff? Why is, why, if SQL is so popular, then why are people talking about NoSQL? So we're going to talk a little bit about some history today, some SQL and relational, some database history. Uh, there's not going to be a quiz at the end, I promise you. And we'll talk about how NoSQL fits into that kind of uh, history of it, why it exists, why people use it. And what I want to focus most of the time on today is one of the kind of um, big question marks when it comes to NoSQL, and that's analytics and reporting and you know data science and dashboards and all those types of things that uh, you know a, a lot of the not so glamorous but really crucially important uh, parts of of systems. I have a short demo for you. Hopefully, it'll be fun. And then I'll wrap up with some uh, more resources if you want to keep exploring this topic uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm Matt Groves. I think uh, some of you recognize me from last time. Uh, it says developer advocate on there, but I'm actually, my, my job title these days is uh, pr product marketing manager, but like a technical product marketing manager. So I'm still very much uh, interested in helping developers and writing code myself and doing all kinds of technical stuff. Um, I'm an MVP, Pluralsight author, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you're watching this recording uh, later, um, just know that this is the Houston DevOps group. It's a cool group of people in Houston that are doing some cool stuff. Check it out, meetup.com slash Houston DevOps meetup. And this is what I used to look like when I used to leave the house, wear suit and ties and stuff. And this is what I look like these days, as you can see on the Zoom chat there. It's been a, it's been a rough year and year and a half, I guess. <laughs> All right, so yeah. let's get on with it. <laughs> SQL plus plus. So let's go a little bit back in back in time here and talk about the history of databases. So there was a time before SQL. There was a time before relational databases. And this is a guy here named EF Codd. He did a lot of great theoretical work and research, including the invention of the relational database. Uh, before that, databases were, you know, kind of all over the place. They were uh, very system specific. They were file based or directory based or hierarchy based or whatever, right? And and he came up with this relational model um, for a number of reasons, but one of them was to kind of uh, reduce uh, data duplication, uh, maximize disk space, things like that. And he actually uh, wrote uh, came up with a a query language called Alpha, and it was never really implemented uh, in any real system, but it was very influential as you'll see later on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always good to go back and, and uh, you know, look at some of this historical papers and historical information. So if you look in EF Codd's original paper, it's not terribly long. But there's an interesting quote in there where he kind of predicts that, hey, this relational model is great for the world right now. But in the future, when disk space isn't a big deal uh, and performance is more important, that maybe... Uh, something besides a relation uh, would be useful to store data. Uh, blasphemy. Then, <laughs> Absolute blasphemy. I know, right? I know. But it's, it's just so interesting to see how prescient he was, even as he created something so important and revolutionary as a relational model that he's even predicted, you know, uh, and allowed for something other than that to exist. So then along come these guys, Don, Don Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce. I'm going to make a long story short here, but they were working with COD. They were students of COD. And uh, they were they took a little more of a uh, pragmatic tack than, than COD did. Uh, his stuff was very theoretical, mathematical based. And they were more interested in providing something that was a, a more general purpose, useful, uh, English friendly, kind of like how you had assembly language. And then you had COBOL come along that was a little more... Uh, useful for regular people to work with, to get stuff done with. Uh, and just a little bit of trivia, the BCNF, you've heard of this before, Boyce Cod Normal Form. That's where you get the Boyce and the Cod from. Uh, so this is a picture of Don Chamberlain. Raymond Boyce is no longer with us, but Don Chamberlain actually is an advisor at Couchbase, uh, which is a NoSQL database, which is pretty cool. It's going to come up later. But these days, of course, when people say SQL and say relational, they're, they're kind of like synonyms. But I think it's important to point out that's not exactly 100% of the, of the story. You know, relational was invented before SQL, and SQL was invented as a language to use with relational. But there are kind of concepts that are independent. I'm going to skip ahead maybe 20 or 30 years here, and SQL is, of course, dominating. Relational is dominating. And there's 
all kinds of um, criticisms of relational. We're going to talk about some of those today. And I mentioned the EF COD pointing out the trade-off already. So there's all, all kinds of trade-offs and uh, things that we uh, kind of put up with in order to get, get some stuff done. But there are criticisms of, of relational databases. It's not the perfect ideal database model. There isn't one, right? Otherwise, we'd all be using it. So the first one is impedance mismatch. And this is probably the one you're most familiar with if you're writing any sort of data-driven apps or APIs. Uh, in the database here on the left, I've got uh, five pieces of data stored, uh, five rows. Uh, five rows. In uh, two different tables. And that's five pieces of data that actually represents two entities, uh, two shopping carts, as they exist in the application. The application is on the right there, just a C-sharp class. Um, nothing special about C-sharp here. You don't have to... Uh, this is not going to be a C-sharp uh, presentation, but uh, you can see the kind of the, the mismatch here between the data. And this is called an impedance mismatch. And so we have tools to deal with this, mainly ORMs like Entity Framework and Hibernate uh, and so on. And, you know, they mostly do a good job. Mostly. Anyone who's used one for a long period of time has uh, no doubt run into some issues with this and had to work around it or, or fight the ORM sometimes myself included. So that little arrow in there, that's going to be a theme today, the little arrow in the middle between those two. It's a small, simple looking arrow, but there's a lot of complexity, a lot of workarounds and hacks and bugs and stuff that's possible in that little arrow there. So always keep in mind, what, what does that little arrow actually represent? The other thing we talk about with relational is scaling. Uh, it's uh, sometimes challenging to scale a relational database and historically not been a problem because uh, you know, the relational database was invented in the 70s, and there was not massive amounts of people who were trying to access applications with those databases behind them. Uh, but if you need to scale it, you can just scale it vertically. So you take the, the machine that's running the database and you make it bigger. You give it more processor, more memory, more disk, whatever. This is called vertical scaling. And this can get expensive, and it can eventually hit a ceiling. We're going to talk about that ceiling here in a minute. The other option is called horizontal scaling, where you just add additional machines or nodes to a cluster that talk to each other via network. And you can do this. Uh, sometimes this can be uh, less expensive, uh, depending on what you're doing. It can scale larger than a vertical database. So you can, you can work around the limitations of the vertical there. But it's difficult to accomplish with a relational database because the way that relations work is that data is uh, um, strongly coupled, tightly coupled to the table that it's in. So it's difficult to do this because if we want to split a table amongst six different nodes, well, then do we have six different tables on those nodes? Do we have backup copies? How do we, how do we split the data up? And so here's an interesting article. This is published, I think, circa 2005 but I think it's still relevant today. It's called The Free Lunch is Over by Herb Sutter, who's a very influential C, C++ guy, if you've not heard of him before. And he published an article called The Free Lunch is Over. It basically just says, hey, we're still increasing transistors, but um, you know, our, our clock speed, our, our power, our performance is not getting any better. Uh, so what we have to do now is we have to think about concurrency. We have to think about distributed systems and therefore distributed databases to spread the load amongst multiple machines. And then the last thing is uh, in, inflexibility of relational databases. So uh, in, in the meantime, since EFCOD invented this and, and SQL was invented, uh, there was, there's just been this rise of agile methodologies, the Agile Manifesto. One of the main points there is we value responding to change over following a plan. Relational databases, however, uh, are force you into a strict plan for your data, a, a strict schema for each table. So a simple change of say, moving a credit card number field from a customer table to a new billing table, for instance, that requires a foreign key, altering tables, moving data over, and all this stuff might require you to lock your database or put it into a read-only state, have some downtime, come in at 2 a.m. on a Saturday and, uh, and run those uh, schema changes. And then the more complex the schema change, the bigger the database, the more impact it has, which means the more expensive and risky this change becomes. Therefore, uh, responding to change becomes very expensive and, and hard to do in some cases. So those are the criticisms of relational over the years. And I know I've been 
uh, dunking on relational a lot, but I want to just say up front with a disclaimer, a relational database is fine. I don't think relational is dead. Uh, you know, there's lots of places where relational database is perfectly acceptable. If you're working with a small data set for some definition of small, uh, if you're working with uh, simple or data structures that rarely change for, again, some definition of what that means, or if you aren't feeling any performance or scaling pain, or at least not yet, then that's fine. Then there's no reason to ditch it. If it's working for you, then, then keep going. But uh, I, you know, if, if you're in that situation, that's fine. Don't turn off your mind just yet. Uh, you're not facing these problems now, but you may face them in the future. You know, like, like Dan was saying early on, you know, this is all about community. I, I may not need someone with AWS experience right now, but I'm going to maybe run into that in the future. So it's, it's good to know what options are out there, how this stuff might work, and how this might solve the problem when I run into it later. So let's talk about NoSQL uh, and SQL++. What if it's not fine? The relational situation is not fine. We're running into some of those problems. We're hitting those ceilings. Uh, we're, uh, it's getting expensive or it's getting slow or both. So with a distributed database, with a database that's multiple machines, you have now isolated pieces of data. These are typically called documents uh, and that they can be stored on any number. They can be split however you want to on any number of nodes. And that's typically called shards. And whenever I think of shards, I think of this scene from Superman for some reason, I don't know why it just comes to mind, but they're not tightly coupled to a table. Uh, so that, that allows us to distribute them amongst the different nodes. And that gives us a lot more options in terms of scaling. So just an example here, this is an example of a piece of data. This is a document that represents an airline, United Airlines. And it has a, uh, you can imagine this as a row in a table, for instance, right? It's relatively simple and flat data. Notice the document key there, it's airline 5209. And you can think of a document database as a special kind of key value store, like a giant dictionary. We can look up this document by that key. And there's some JSON value in there. This is gonna vary from database to database, but generally speaking, that's, that's how a document database looks. Here's a more complex example. This is a, uh, a route between uh, two uh, airports. I have a source and a destination airport. And then inside of this, I've got some, some just flat information, but I've also got this a schedule element in here. It's a, it's a nested array of objects. In the relational database, that would at least be one separate table with foreign keys, right? So we might have four pieces of data instead of just the one here. But in this case, we don't have a foreign key because it's all domestic data. So there's, there's no mismatch. We can map this object right to a C-sharp or Java object just with a standard JSON uh, deserializer. Um, there's no schema to follow. So I could add other fields to just this one document if it was necessary to do that. I don't have to come in at 2 a.m. to change the schema. I could just change this one particular document uh, if I wanted to. Uh, now, schedule is an array in this case, but you don't always have to denormalize in a document database. So notice the airline ID field at the very top. That's pointing to another document with a key of airline 5209 uh, because we, you know, we, we still don't want to necessarily duplicate data if we don't have to. So we can still kind of refer to a separate document that holds the name of the airline, the headquarters of the airline, you know, whatever uh, that would be in there. And so we could perform some sort of join or a lookup uh, to do that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, lookup if we need to, that, that kind of joining of information. So the basic operations of NoSQL, and this goes back to, again, the very beginning of NoSQL, as you have, uh, it's the standard key-based operation. So we're going to get a document by key, set it by key, you know, update it or insert it, delete it by key. And then what separates this from a key value store is that we have other options to query the data because it's in a format like JSON. All the data is in a standard format. We can then use a MapReduce or other operational queries. Uh, MongoDB, for instance, has a JavaScript-like query language. Uh, Couchbase for operational query language actually uses SQL. I may have touched on that last time I was here. Uh, actually uses regular SQL for operational queries. Uh, we're going to talk about SQL for the difference between operational and analytics here in a minute, but uh, just, just wanted to throw that out there. There's lots of options for that, those kind of uh, secondary lookups. 
But I want to I want to focus a lot on just that one thing today: reporting and analytics. This is a question that comes up a lot from from people who are maybe haven't used NoSQL before. Is that okay? There's lots of appealing things about it, but what about reporting? You know, what about analytics and BI? Uh, because now we maybe have a very large amount of data. You know, suppose our database is used for the back end of an e-commerce site, for instance. Everything's humming along nicely. Customers are adding items to the shopping cart. They're making purchases. They're browsing a catalog. And we've got all the operational queries that are indexed and all that stuff's going fine. But now I have to, I have to create a report. Um, someone's asking for a specific uh, ad hoc query, for instance. The business office says, hey, we, we noticed some anomalies. We need you to run this kind of report uh, about the system. So it's a, now it's a complicated or, or ad hoc query. I don't have the proper indexing for that or the proper sizing or tuning for that query. And so if I try to run that query directly on my operational database, I could impact customers. Uh, I could slow them down or I could ca start causing timeouts. I could crash the database. Um, if, if my query is you know, inefficient or gets into some sort of loop, we don't, we don't want to do that. And uh, of course, with, a, with a many NoSQL databases, we have to learn a whole new query language, even to attempt uh, that sort of query on the data, um, which, you know, okay, I'm, I'm not against learning new things, but, um, you know, like, like I said, the SQL is a very popular uh, language. A lot of people know it. It's going to make it easier for our team to ramp up uh, if, if it's a familiar language. We don't have to necessarily learn a whole brand new thing from the ground up. So analytics and reporting is what I want to focus on today. I'm happy to discuss other NoSQL topics, of course, but I want to focus on analytics and reporting uh, today because that's, I think, where uh, SQL++ and big data uh, are really, uh, they really shine. So I want to define a couple terms here first. We'll talk, we'll talk about the differences here in a bit but and when to use each one. But operational, when I think of operational queries, I think of the moment-to-moment -moment data operations and queries that your website needs to function to serve customers. So these are the queries that uh, that drive your website. That, you know the the stuff that the public, their customers, whoever your users are actually using to get stuff done. And then when I think of operational analytics, I think of queries and reporting that's very close to real time. Um, maybe it's uh, something like the last six months of data, or maybe it's the last hour of data, for that matter. Things like dashboards, reporting, trend analysis, that kind of stuff. And then I don't have it on here, but I think of an, another one that's more of a traditional analytics. And that's those are the operations and queries you need to, to, uh, to run reports and serve customers in the extreme long run, the extreme history. So things like data science, data engineering, uh, that kind of stuff would be, I think, a third class. We'll talk about that briefly here. So let's just give you an example of operational uh, operational queries, operational data. So this is cars.com. This is a Couchbase customer. Uh, they have a website. They have a, maybe have a mobile app or anything else where there's a lot of end users or customers, a lot of public um, stuff happening with your website. So just some examples. Maybe there's a query that you run on the database when a, when a buyer comes along and wants to get a list of possible makes and models, and you're going to drive that from the database perhaps. Or maybe a buyer comes along and they want a list of cars within a certain search radius, like 30 miles from my house, 30 miles from my zip code. I want to search for cars. Or maybe a seller comes to the site and says they want to get a list of all the cars that they have currently on their for sale. So a lot of dealerships use cars.com. could be a lot of cars on their website. So these are queries that are going to run often. And they're going to be run concurrently with many other users. So, you know, cars.com gets probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of visits a day. So these queries need to be well-defined. They should be well-indexed. They should run very quickly because if a customer has to wait too long, they're going to go to a different website. They're going to, or they're going to lose patience and, and just give up. So that's what operational means to me. It needs to be very uh, under, well understood and optimized and quick. Operational analytics, on the other hand, and I've kind of blurred this out because it's, I don't I don't want to get into too spe many specifics here, uh, but this answers enterprise wide questions in as close to real time as we can possibly pull off. So uh, I don't know exactly what cars.com will be interested in, but some examples would be how many cars were sold today, uh, or this week, or this month. Uh, how many were sold year over year? 
compared to last year? How, uh, what are the real-time rankings? Who are my top sellers? What are the top uh, model years or more models uh, being sold? And we might want to drill down on those. We'll drill down on by manufacturer, by car type. Maybe we'll want to do some market research into, oh, should we buy some advertising for a particular demographic that is more predisposed to pickup trucks, for instance? So there could be a huge number of permutations and complexity here. Um, but we, it, it's going to be low concurrency, though. This isn't going to be the type of stuff that uh, a lot of people are going to be accessing. It's going to be mostly you know, cars.com employees or consultants or whatever. Only a handful of people are going to have access to run these kinds of queries or admin dashboard, for instance. It's, it's going to be an order of magnitude way lower than the public use. So for the operational workload, just to kind of recap here, we're going to have lots of concurrent queries, lots of customers hitting the website. We're going to, it's going to be well-defined. Each query is going to have its own well-defined role in, in providing data to the website. It's going to be relatively simple. And I, I say that, uh, you know, I don't want you to think these are going to be just really basic, easy to write queries, but they're going to be generally speaking, compared to what we're going to write later, relatively simple queries. And performance is vital for these because how long is the customer willing to wait until they ditch your site? You know, it may be some studies say like two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. You gotta have these queries that run that quickly. As opposed to the operational analytics workload, it's gonna be low concurrency. It's going to be, you know, uh, queries may be run at the same time, but only by a handful of people um, internal to your company or, you know, consultants or whatever. They're going to be ad hoc uh, in nature. They're going to be different every day, perhaps, or different every week, um, different every hour, uh, based on the business needs, the questions you want to answer. The queries could be very, very complex. Um, they could be, you know, multiple window functions and time series and CTEs and all kinds of joins and massaging of data, lots of complicated stuff going on there. And performance and low latency is always nice. No one wants to wait longer than they have to, but but this is not impacting web page load times directly. Performance and low latency is a nice to have, I think for operational analytics workload. So it would be an acceptable trade-off for all these things if we had to wait a little longer for that. So if any of this sounds familiar to you, um, I, you know, I don't know if you've called it this before, but operational analytics is what I consider it. How is this done? So in my work experience, um, every, every job I've had since college just about has had some form of this operational analytics. And I've seen three or four approaches. I want to take you through some of these approaches, see if they seem familiar to you. So this is the first approach I saw, my first job right out of college, and this was our operational analytics plan. It was, I don't know, we don't really have a plan. You copycats. Uh, we, <laughs> we don't. We don't think about it. Um, plan. We have a bunch of access databases sitting around uh, that are just kind of used by, uh, you know, accountants and, and finance people, and they're just sort of copied around or on a shared drive somewhere. And if we need the operational data, we copy it when we want to. Maybe every month we take a copy of the general ledger and paste it into an access database and, and just work on that for the next month. Or and I've, I've seen this before too, we just link directly to the database and hope that no one screws up and issues a query that's going to make the database spin for everybody else. So you don't have to raise your hand, but uh, <laughs> I bet this seems familiar to some of you. Uh, everybody hold your tongues. I, I will call out in the uh, chat for real quick here in the chat. Uh, if you'll DM Lindsay, you can get in on the uh, giveaway. There's going to be a giveaway at the end of the uh presentation here so uh check out the chat for details on that yeah and by the way feel free to stop me anytime if you got questions or comments and you can throw them in the chat too if you like no Matt, i, I love this topic frankly i was sitting I'm sitting here looking at this and there's for, for for those of us who are old enough we you know we used to spend a lot of time wringing our hands about the size of databases and the growth of the database and yada 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 and now it seems like we you know, with cloud stuff, we didn't even think about it. We just put it out there and go. And a lot of those, uh, a lot of those barriers to building have been stripped away and kind of obfuscated a little bit by by cloud and some of the things that are there. So, 
when I use the first NoSQL database I used, boy, I got some weird looks. People just didn't get it at all. And uh, it was, uh, they're still complaining about it. That, that was years ago. I mean, I heard from the person that's still there. They, they still gripe about the fact that I use MongoDB. What the heck is that? Yeah, you know, I think you're right. Uh, you know, the cloud can sometimes, you know, we can handle those scaling problems in, in the cloud, but it, you know, sometimes it comes at a, at a pretty hefty cost. Um, it may, you know, abstract some of the details away from us, but it doesn't necessarily abstract the cost away from us. So it's definitely still something to keep, keep in mind. All right, so that's that's the uh, first uh, approach I've seen to operational analytics. And I think this one is still going on, whether we want to see it or not, it's still happening lots of places. The second approach I see is a little bit better. It's a, it's a more disciplined approach and it's exporting your operational data to a, a relation, another relational database and then using SQL on that, like a data warehouse. Uh, Martin Fowler, the link there at the bottom actually calls this a reporting database pattern. And again, we've got that little arrow in the middle uh, which it can be tricky. It's This may be copies from one database or multiple databases uh, into that reporting database. And so that little arrow means we have to create um, and maintain some sort of ETL or buy an ETL uh, or multiple ETLs to fill that little arrow in. Uh, we're back to the impedance mismatch problem again. So especially if our operational databases have JSON or semi-structured data, uh, then we have to make that fit in the reporting database somehow because we want to use SQL on it. Uh, and maybe the reporting database has a different schema, duplicated data, it's optimized for reporting queries, et cetera. And so we're right back to the size and performance question again. Uh, you know, if this reporting database, we have to scale it vertically and, and put it on a more expensive machine to handle that reporting. Uh, so we're back to this similar problems. I think this is a better approach than answer, than answer one, but uh, it does have problems of its own. The third one, which I have not seen personally, uh, I've not worked on any system like this, but uh, this is an approach a lot of people use for analytics. It's, it's you just use Hadoop. Um, and if you're not familiar with Hadoop, that's okay. Uh, it's, it's a uh, storage system basically that's designed for really, really massive scale. I, I believe this came out of some of the search engines trying to basically store the entire web uh, for search purposes. Um, it's, uh, it's analytics, I would say, but it's not operational analytics. Uh, using, H using Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem is a whole other topic, by the way. This is a little bit more of what the ecosystem looks like. This may be a, too big of a hammer or too slow of a hammer for operational analytics. Um, and there's still an ETL problem here. So you have tools down there at the bottom like Flume and Kafka and Scoop that are trying to uh, you know, scrape data from wherever else and put it into Hadoop. And then Hadoop itself is not particularly fast. Uh, it's not designed to be fast. It's designed to be storing huge amounts of data cheaply. So then all these other things you see around it are the tools that were created to kind of get around the problem of Hadoop being slow. Uh, so things like Spark, where you're actually loading Hadoop into memory. Because, because when Hadoop was first around, memory was, uh, well, it's still not exactly cheap, but it was not, it was not, uh, it was very expensive when Hadoop was first around. So it was used disks. But then you have all these things built on top of that, Hadoop YAR and Hadoop MapReduce. And if you want to run SQL queries, now you have Spark and you have Spark SQL on top of that. And I think Hive can also do SQL queries. So SQL on top of MapReduce, on top of Yarn, on top of HDFS. And now you got to manage this whole ecosystem of tools just to run your analytics. So if, you're, if your analytics are in, in a situation where you have petabytes of data, like just massive, massive amounts of data. This is probably the approach you can take. Um, you're not going to get great performance out of it uh, and or you're going to spend a lot of time managing this whole ecosystem. But for that massive amount of data, this is pretty much what you want. So if you're if you have a, a company that goes back to the turn of the century and you want to uh, analyze data of the entire history of the company, Maybe the New York Times wants to analyze their, all their records back to you know early 1900s. This might be the system for that. Uh, if you want uh, to check out more about this, there's a link at the bottom that goes into Hadoop ecosystem some more. So that's bit.ly slash Hadoop underscore ecosystem. It's a great blog post that goes through all the different pieces of that. And of course, the fourth one is what uh, I'm here to mainly talk about is SQL++. 
uh, basically the approach here just says you already know how to write SQL, um, but it's designed to work with the strict, the richly structured data, the JSON data. And the approach that Couchbase has taken is that we're going to have minimal or no ETL required. So that little arrow, we're going to try to make that as simple as possible. By the way, this is a cover of a book here and just notice the author. It's our old friend, Don Chamberlain. He's back again. So he's, uh, he's working with uh, Couchbase on, uh, uh, you know, the, something he invented years and years ago, working on the next generation of that. So I think that's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty cool to work at the same company that uh, Don Chamberlain is a kind of a tech advisory board member. So I like that a lot. So let's do a quick SQL review. I'm hoping, again, most of you are probably familiar with SQL. If you're not, that's okay. Uh, happy to take questions about it. I've used SQL basically my whole career. So it's like a second nature to me, but I understand not everybody necessarily that comfortable with it. But here's an example of a really, really simple SQL query. So we've got my table there on the left. It's got three rows of data and I've got a query here on the right. That query is going to uh, return some subset of that data, basically. A select query is going to do that. So uh, let's, let's try to make this interactive. Anybody in the audience care to wager a guess at what this would return, this query on the right, given the data on the left, what that's going to return? It's okay to give a wrong guess. Be bold. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, it's going to select, it's going to return a result set with one row and it's going to have two columns, Matt, uh, for the first one and Groves for the second one because the Baz equals Cux there on the first row. So that's what's going to return. Matt and Groves. Okay. So that's your relational database and that's your SQL language together. Let's try mixing it up a little bit. Let's have a JSON database, a document database here on the left with basically the same data, but in JSON format. Now notice the difference here is we have, instead of data that's all coupled to the my table, there's this concept of a bucket instead, which is all this data, each of these pieces of JSON data can be put on individual servers and they can live on any server. They don't have to belong to a single table. And as Don Chamberlain actually once said, if you squint, JSON kind of looks like tables. So just try to turn your head a little bit and squint. And you'll, you'll see them. <laughs> but let's, let's see if we can apply SQL to that same data. So here's a query on the right here. It's basically the exact same query, exact same syntax. What would you expect that would return if you had to guess? Matt Groves again? That's right. It's going to return instead a uh, JSON array of JSON objects that say uh, foo Matt bar Groves. Easy enough. So there's a whole uh, academic paper uh, that uh, defines SQL++. This was back in 2015, I believe. This is a research project out of uh, UCSD. And I'll give you a link to this if you want to read it later. So Couchbase saw this paper and decided that it made a lot of sense because uh, Couchbase is a, is a document database. And so Couchbase actually used this paper and uh, worked through this to create Nickel, N1QL, as their operational query language. So that's the, the query language you use for cars.com website. That would be the query language that you use there. However, they went on to also use it for analytics as well and the reporting aspect of it later. So they sort of doubled down on SQL and, and the SQL++. SQL++ is backwards compatible with SQL. So everything you're used to from SQL joins, unions, aggregation group by, uh, select. Uh, you may not be familiar with let and limit uh, if you're from the SQL Server background, but you know it's like... Uh, setting variables basically, or if you're familiar with top, same kind of concept there, order by, uh, you know, with for common table expressions, everything you expect from SQL is there. Now the underlying data is different. It's not tables and rows. It's collections of JSON documents, but the language is essentially the same. The plus plus there is because SQL is made for the flat relational data in tables. SQL++ takes it a step further and says we're going to add some things to the language to help deal with the structured and semi-structured data that can be stored in JSON. So therefore, it has some superpowers. So let's look at some of the superpowers. There's, there's too many to go over in, in a session tonight. So I'm just going to show you what I think are the most interesting ones that are easy to explain. And then if you want 
if you want to ask, hey, can I do this? Can I do this? I'm happy to have that discussion. Uh, I might have to look some things up in the docs, but I'm happy to have that discussion. So here's an example of two documents here. Uh, in JSON, you can have nested objects, so objects within objects, like address here. So if I wanted to, say, get the city from each of these documents, how would I write a SQL query to do that? I don't expect you to know the answer, but uh, maybe you could uh, wager a guess. Select from where? <laughs> yeah, well, yes, of course, select from. Um, but uh, we're going to select address.city. So we're going to introduce some dotted notation just to navigate that hierarchy of objects. So address.city. And this would return, uh, in this case, it would return Grove City and Columbus. All right, so far so good. So right, right now, go ahead and update your resume, put SQL++ plus plus on there, you got it. Let's look at arrays. So JSON can also have arrays. In this case, I've got two documents that have favorite foods. This happened to be act my actual favorite foods and my daughter's actual favorite foods. So if I wanted to select, let's say, the second most favorite food from everybody in, uh, in this database, how would I write a SQL query for that? Okay, so again, it would be just kind of what you might expect, square brackets, and we'll put one in there. So this is going to return cheesecake and Lucky Charms, second most favorite food of Matt and Emma. All right, easy, easy as that. Okay, now let's go to something a little more interesting. So we've got, let's look back at this favorite foods again, this one document, it's Matt, it's three favorite foods. In a relational database, this would be a separate table typically and would require a join. So you'd have a user, Matt, and you'd have a, a table like favorite foods and it would be pizza, cheesecake, donuts would be three, three rows in that table. But we've got it just in one document here. It's all together. However, we could still perform a kind of join here. We could join that favorite foods array to the user document. And for reporting reasons, we might wanna do that sometimes. Uh, and so way to do that in SQL++ is we use something called unnest. And so in this query here, I'm going to select the food and select the name from my users. I'm going to unnest that favorite foods array into, let's just call it a variable uh, with a label of food. And so what do you think the results of this would be? You know, just think of like a typical join, uh, what the results might look like. So we're just going to project it uh, three times. It's kind of like a, like a cross product sort of thing. It's gonna be pizza mat, cheesecake mat, donuts mat. So we've unnested that data out to the top level. And instead of one document, now we have three documents because we've performed this, this unnest, which sometimes I call an intra document join. We're not joining between documents, we're joining uh, the document to itself basically. Okay, I think I got one more here. Um, let's go back to the favorite foods again. So I showed you the array syntax before, but it's kind of obnoxious. You have to know the exact index of an item that you want to select, right? Uh, you know, it was uh, favorite foods, uh, square bracket one, right? But what if I wanted to ask a question, something like, who are the users that have pizza as a favorite food? Uh, how would I go through and do that? I'd have to examine each one of those arrays I could say, you know, favorite food zero, favorite foods one, favorite foods two, and test each of them individually. But then what if the array is different sizes? You know, if it's, I have 10 different favorite foods and three, uh, Emma still has three and I have 10. So what we can do is we can do a quantification. So this is kind of like a Lambda function. I, I, I don't want to make it sound fancier than it is, but basically we're just going to say for favorite foods, we're going to create a, 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 like a loop variable that's going to stand in for each one of those items and select any of the users that have uh, a F equals pizza. So one of the array items equals pizza. And there we go. So this is going to return Matt. So we can navigate through all those arrays. By the way, this is an array of strings. It could be an array of objects and each object could itself have an array and so on. So it could be very complicated nested data here. That's all I wanna show for example so far. Uh, there's a lot more SQL++ plus plus than that, but I thought it was useful to kind of show the arrays and nested objects in action. 
There are, to my knowledge, there are four uh, different systems, four pieces of technology out there that are implemented SQL++ that you can start using today. So if you want to try this out yourself. So the first one is Couchbase. Uh, this is probably the most complete production ready one that anyone can start using today. I want to focus on the analytics part of it today. So in Couchbase uh, cluster, you have multiple nodes in the cluster. You have nodes that can have the data service on them and you can have nodes that have the analytics service on them. It's all part of the same cluster. And then we can uh, do what's called a workload isolation here. So the analytics service is going to basically get a copy, a shadow copy of the data, of the operational data into the analytics service nodes. And notice that little arrow there, this little link between the data service and analytics service. So it's kind of like an ETL, but it's real time. And it's not something you have to create as a separate process. It's basically something you create with uh, two simple commands. Actually, these days with the newer version, it's, it's just a UI. You can even fall back to the UI in a couple clicks and get that going. Otherwise, it's completely automated. So you don't have to set up a cron job or uh, ETL process. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, do reads ever, um, are they ever over like getting read from that data set that's copied over that you mentioned? Like uh, if, sorry, could you say that one more time? A database read, would it ever um, would it ever hit that copy on the analytics service that you were mentioning? You said it had a copy of the data set, like a yeah. caching database. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea is it's a read only copy, in fact. So it's only four reads. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. So the, the the if you notice there in the top right, the SQL plus plus query is going to be executed against that shadow data set, that that copy. Okay, okay. Right. I see. Right. And then you get the results from that. And then, so it's a read-only copy. If there's a change made to that to the data in the in the data service, as there will often be, that change gets automatically propagated in real time to the analytics uh, shadow data set. So it's not like you have to wait 24 hours. It's just a matter of, you know, probably less than a second, uh, depending on how much, you know, how much uh, volume of operations you have coming in. I'm going to show a demo of this in action, in fact. Uh, and the other thing, this is kind of new to Couchbase. It's, I don't think it's completely released yet. It's currently in beta, but it's a public beta, is that you can also connect this analytics service to external sources. So not just the data in that Couchbase cluster, but you can connect to other Couchbase clusters. So for instance, I don't know if they use this at LinkedIn, but LinkedIn's a large Couchbase customer. They don't have just one Couchbase cluster. They have hundreds of clusters. So if I wanted to bring in data from multiple sources to run reports or whatever, I can now connect analytics to multiple Couchbase clusters. And uh, S3, AWS S3, is kind of becoming a very um, popular, almost industry standard uh, API for accessing large data files. Uh, not just AWS, by the way, but other people are providing uh, S3 compatible uh, cloud storage as well. So we can now bring in JSON, CSV, TSV, data sources into that data set as well. I'm gonna show you an example of this too when we get to the demo. So we can bring all these sources together into one place. It's a, like a shadow copy of the data and run SQL queries on all of it and get results. Uh, excuse me, Matt, what, what yeah. do you mean by shadow copy? Yeah, so shadow copy, it basically means that it's, it is a copy of the live data that's on the data service there, on this data service buckets here. It's a live copy of this data. So this is, you're gonna be executing queries against the data stored on these machines, which means my query is not going to have any impact on these machines. I see. Uh, so only okay. the writes go to the data servers, not to the analytics servers. That's right. Oh, you can't, okay. I can't make writes to this at all. That's right. Okay. okay. And again, I'm gonna show this in action here later. Uh, the other implementation I know of is Asterix DB, and this is a, it's kind of came out of the UCSD um, a project. And this is um, a, a, a big data management system. It uh, has some data ingestion capabilities, so ETL, has some adapters like HDFS for Hadoop, local file system, things like that. Basically, this is an open source uh, tool that Couchbase is using like a forked version of, along with our own uh, custom data ingestion um, uh, 
systems as well. So this is kind of what Couchbase is using under the hood for analytics. But if you wanted to build your own from scratch, this would be, you know, this would be the engine you want to put into the into your system. Another one's called Apache Drill. This is kind of like a uh, in-place analytics. So it's not going to make shadow copies as far as I can tell. Um, so that could be a workload isolation problem. This goes back to the, you know, I'm going to run a, a, a lousy query against uh, production data and that could you know, hurt performance, hurt customers, things like that. Um, but this can connect to a wide variety of databases. And I, I really like this screenshot because I just fired up a Docker container and it, the prompt is this isn't your grandfather's sequel, right? Right at the beginning. So I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty bold stance there. The last one I wanna talk about is called Particle. This is an Amazon backed effort um, to create an open source project uh, implementation of SQL++. And what they're doing with it so far, based I can tell is they're using it as an operational query language for DynamoDB um, and not for reporting or analytics. And so because it's using Dynamo, it's not a complete implementation of SQL. So there's no joins, there's, there's not, as best I can tell anyway, there's not any CTEs or uh, anything complex like that. It's very, very basic select queries because this Dynamo is just limited to that behind the scenes. However, Particle itself is an open source project with a complete implementation. So, and I think it's either based on or written by that same SQL++ paper. So everything goes back to that SQL++ paper basically. So I don't, I don't know, this is relatively in the early stages. I don't know what Amazon plans to do with this, if anything other than just add some really, really basic SQL syntax to DynamoDB. And before I go over to the demo, I just want to mention indexing. Uh, SQL++ supports indexing, um, much like relational databases support indexing. However, sometimes you don't necessarily need to worry about indexes right off the bat because of the way this works under the hood. It uses a concept called massive parallel processing, MPP. And it uses, uh, it just examines the metadata that it's, uh, it writes as it brings this data in the shadow copy and uses that to pick on execution plan. Now the long answer is check out this video. If you're really interested in those gory details, bit.ly slash under underscore hood, and you can see all about how MPP works behind the scenes. But uh, the idea here is you don't necessarily need an index to start with. You can just start querying and it'll be, usually be fast enough uh, and if it's not, then then you can start looking into indexing. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go to the demo next, uh, unless you have any questions, happy to answer those as I transition over there. Yeah, do, do you, um, how do you uh, co-mingle with, with Splunk solutions? Co-mingle with what solutions? Splunk. Splunk. Um, I, I actually don't know. I don't think I've tried a, a Splunk, uh, integration with Couchbase. Okay. That's a good question. I mean, this might, this might be, uh, it might be where a Splunk competitor for that matter. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, but I think they could work together too. It's so. possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I will have to look into that. Actually, I'm going to make a quick note to myself. Um, okay. All right, so what I've got here is I've got uh, this Couchbase. This is the this is Couchbase Seven, which is currently in beta. You can download if you want to, uh, and and play with it uh, to your heart's content. I've got some data in here. I'm going to just focus on this one here. I've actually loaded in. If you're familiar with SQL Server, you may have heard of AdventureWorks before. So I've loaded in all of AdventureWorks into Couchbase, uh, so you can see all the different schemas and. Uh, tables get converted into Couchbase scopes and collections. It's not really super important for this demo, but you can see like, uh, if you're familiar with VentureWorks, you know, there's a person table and a person schema, and here's a, a person uh, in there. It's just, instead of relational data, it's JSON data. So I just, I just imported that all into Couchbase. So now I'm over in this analytics tab. And uh, before I do that, let me go to servers. I just have the one server here. This is, just running on my local machine. In production, you'd see a big list of servers here typically. And these services would be spread out amongst the different machines to isolate the workload, right? So I've got them all running on one node um, just because I'm running it locally. But I would typically have, you know, maybe three nodes that are running data and then three nodes running analytics and then maybe some running query, et cetera. Okay, so that's why I have this analytics button right here. 
Uh, notice by default, I have this local link. So I can link to my data that's in my current local uh, Couchbase cluster. So I'm going to create some shadow copies, some data sets from my AdventureWorks data. So let's go ahead and add collection here. I'm going to call this one sales order detail. And that's going to link to sales and sales order detail. Okay, so there's one. I'm going to sales order. This is a sales, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Let me read this. Sales order header. Uh, so it's just kind of the relational model here. I have a sales order header, and then that can have one or more sales order detail lines for it, like a join together. I'm going to do one more here. I'm going to bring in a person. And so this is just going to be person and person. If you're not familiar with AdventureWorks, this is kind of what it looks like. You have all these tables and schemas. So like uh, sales, sales order header, sales order detail, et cetera. It's all in AdventureWorks there. I'm just gonna look at a small portion of AdventureWorks today. Okay, I'll bring over a person. All right. So now those, uh, those data, that's data is linked over live. So let's go ahead and, and do a quick SQL query here. Accounts from sales order. We've got 31,000 sales orders. And I've got uh, detail, I've got 121,000 sales order details. I can typically join those and get the full sales order, et cetera. I've also got person in here, which has 19,000 person. Okay, I haven't created a single index yet. I can add them when necessary, but I'm going on the strength of MPP alone with these queries. And it's a relatively small amount of data as well. So I'm not too concerned about that. So let's put in something crazy here. This is a query that's going to uh, have a join between the sales order details and the sales order. And I'm going to get the total number of items in the order. So maybe the business office comes to me and says, hey, we're noticing some anomalies in April. Uh, could you pull an order, pull a query of every order that has more than five items? Because we're a bike shop and if there's more than five items, there's something suspicious there. So we want to pull those out and examine those manually. Um, so I'm doing a range query here just, just in the month of April. Uh, I'm grouping them, so aggregation, and I want just the ones that have a quantity greater than five. I don't know if this is terribly realistic or not, but it kind of shows off the, the query language. So I'll go ahead and run that. This one's going to take a while to run because, again, no indexes. But there's the results. So I can see sales order ID here has a status of five and has total of six items in the query. I want to show you that this is so good. Uh, you'd mentioned that you imported this into Couchbase. You just mm -hmm. took the SQL database and pulled it in, and yeah. there's no indexes. Now, does the import, will it create indexes based off of what was in the relational database, or do you find that you have to kind of redo your indexing in Couchbase in order to make the queries run? Okay, okay. so... Two things here first. So remember this analytics is a, is a shadow copy of the data. So there's no indexes on the shadow copy. However, right. when I brought in the data uh, in uh, SQL Server, so this is my operational bucket of data. This is where I do the reads and writes to this bucket here. So when I brought those in, I actually did bring in all the indexes from SQL Server. Um, hopefully they'll show up here. What's going on? Person doesn't want to cooperate with me today. What is going on? I had a similar problem with a demo I did last week. Anticipation. The, the UI is not cooperating with me. Hmm. So let me just see if this is, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, well, that's annoying, but uh, I, I, was, I didn't expect to cover this today. So um, I didn't try this out before, but there would be a list of an indexes here. So I have a little utility. If you look at like person table here, indexes, it contains all these indexes. I have a little utility that will read these indexes and create basically a literal translation of that index um, into Couchbase. So those indexes are there in the operational portion of data. Do you find um, that they're effective or do you have to restructure your indexing because oh, oh, you're- here they go, in it showed up. Yes, that's a very good question. So this is a utility that's very experimental for me. Um, actually, I think I have a blog post um, that talks about this. Uh, it's an automated approach 
uh, to migrating from SQL to NoSQL. And, um, you know, it, it just takes a literal literal approach to it. Um, so it's, it's probably a good starting point, especially if you're going to also kind of translate over the same queries that you're running. However, um, if what you can do is you can actually come in here to the, to the query tab, and this is, geez Louise, this index is really giving me, index page is really giving me some problems today. Um, I, was I was going to say there is a, maybe I'll have a screenshot of it somewhere over here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Over to query. If I, if I put in a query in here, let's, uh, let's bring in a query just for fun. This is the, this is an operational query. So we're out of the realm of analytics now, by the way. So let's go ahead and, and run this query in here. And it's not going, it's not going so well. This is a kind of a slower query. Uh, if, if I paste in the couch base, because I may not be using the indexes. I may not have it properly indexed in the first place. What I can do is I can actually, when this finishes running, I can click on uh, plan here. It'll show me uh, the indexes that are being used by this query. So you can kind of go through this step by step and say, okay, this is a slow part. Here's the index. Maybe I need to focus on that index or this one. And I can also click on this tab here, advice which will make some suggestions. Like here's some queries, here's the indexes you're using right now. Here's some that might make your query faster. So that's an approach you can take uh, if we're talking about migrating indexes over. Because yeah, it, it would be nice to automate it completely, but I understand where you're coming from in that it, it may not exactly match up with what we want uh, in the result. So I'll, pay, I'll paste this in the chat if you wanna read more about that. It's a little project I've been working on myself this year, so. Any feedback or questions on that are, are very much appreciated. Uh, back to analytics here. Um, I don't think I let this one finish. Oh, whoops, I, pa I pasted it in the wrong chat, sorry, hang on. There we go, I did let this one finish, okay. What I wanted to show you next is, so I mentioned that this data is a shadow copy, it's updated in real time. So I want to go over to that sales order. So let's go to here and we're going to go to sales and it is sales order. I want to go to header, I think. So here's all the sales header documents. I'm going to go to sales order 69801. Okay, I'm going to change this status from five to 777, which probably isn't valid. I'm going to update the data in my operational side of the data. I go back to analytics. I run this query again. This is only you know a second or two later. The data has been updated here as well. So you can see that it's a real time update as I change the data. I didn't have to wait for an ETL process to run. It just automatically happened. And if I go back and do this again, just to, just to change it back to what it was. What was it, five? I'll go back to analytics, run the query, and we'll see the same thing happen again. Now it's back to five. So I think that's a really cool feature because I don't have to worry about, uh, did my ETL run? Uh, maybe it maybe it decided not to run tonight at, at 2 a.m. So now I got to figure out, I got to troubleshoot that and work through all that. Um, okay, the next thing I wanted to show, the last thing that I want to show was S3. So with analytics, we can now start to connect to external data from different sources. So I could connect to another couch-based uh, cluster if I wanted to, but S3 is a very popular way to uh, store large amounts of data. So I've got an S3 bucket already connected to, I'm not going to show you this because I have to paste in my access key to do that and I'll keep that secret. But this is uh, US East 2, which is the Ohio data center. That's where I am. Notice this endpoint down here as well. So as I said, S3 is kind of becoming a standard. Uh, so other people are providing S3 APIs as well. So this endpoint could be very useful if I wanted to connect to something other than Amazon to get my S3 data, for instance. Anyway, I'm using S, I'm using Amazon S3. I'm going to go ahead and uh, paste a command here. You can do this uh, via UI as well, but I'm going to, just going to do a create data set here. I've got some JSON data that represents a CRM uh, out there on S3. Maybe this is uh, exported from some third-party system. I don't know, hypothetically. I'm going to go ahead and, and create that data set. So now I have the CRM here. 
And now I can query that with uh, SQL. So this is probably gonna be a little slow. Let me just limit this to 10. Again, no indexing here. Give me the first 10 items from the CRM. This is not Couchbase data. This is data that lives out in the JSON file on S3. So there's some data there. I can join these data sets to each other. I can you know, have queries that interact with both of them or all of them. So I've got a somewhat contrived example here that I prepared ahead of time. This is um, selecting all the people with the last name of Smith from my AdventureWorks data and all the people with the last name of Smith from my CRM data. I don't know why I'd wanna highlight these Smiths. I'm gonna get all the distinct names. And ac actually, I, I think I know why I come with this example. So we have a, Couchbase uh, has a customer, the Cincinnati Reds, and they use analytics to um, do a process called householding which is where they have a bunch of disparate data from all kinds of different systems. So when you buy a hot dog at the park, when you buy tickets online, it all goes much different systems and they want to group people together by household so they can determine what kind of promotions to offer and demographics, things like that. And so joining people by their names actually is, is one of the vectors they could use. Uh, sometimes it's home address, sometimes it's phone number, sometimes it's name. So I'll go ahead and execute this one. This might take a while, but I, again, I've created no indexes here. The results are going to be pretty quick. It's about six seconds here, but these are all the Smiths in my system. Uh, combination of AdventureWorks and my CRM data, all in one result there. Yeah, I got a question here. I got Four. a question here. Now, where is that query running? Is it pulling all the S3 data back and running it locally, or is it running it on Amazon server and sending it back just the results? Right. So. So the best of my knowledge, I believe it is making a shadow copy of that data here in Couchbase. It's not running it against the S3 data directly. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that because this is, a real, this is a relatively new feature. It's still in beta. So I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, would, I would hope it wouldn't go to the S3 every time and run a query against it because that could be very slow and a lot of latency potentially, and uh, it could be expensive. So I, I that's why I'm assuming that's making a shadow copy because that's what it's doing with this other data, it's making shadow copies of it. So we can create indexes on it and it's just local data. Um, and then as S3 data gets updated, it would, I, I assume, again, this is where, I, I, this is where I'm not 100% sure is that if the S3 data changes, does that trigger an event that Amazon publishes that Couchbase listens to? That I don't know. So, good question. Hey, good question. Do you know Russell? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got my video on. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I was I was kind of interested in, in how you were doing that as well. Because um, you know, something to think about as an AWS customer is that you know outbound traffic from your VPC is what you pay for. Yeah. And so if you're, you know, if, if you're kind of like saying, well, you know, I want to use this, a solution like this as a quasi pseudo data lake and run my analytics like that, you know, every time you're, you know, you are creating that data set, that shadow data set from your S3 buckets, that may be a huge swath of outbound data traffic. So, right. and we're talking about operational data, stuff that you're going to do frequently. Um, you probably want to put some um, some CloudWatch alarms in your AWS account, uh, you know, to uh, some billing alerts uh, to keep an eye on that. If you know, if you're going to use something like this in a, yeah. on a production workload, right? Well, so that's that's a that's, that's probably just a good idea in general. I, I would say that you can also run Couchbase inside your VPC as well, so it wouldn't necessarily yeah. be outbound <laughs> traffic between them. Uh, in fact, Couchbase has a fully managed offering that runs yeah. in your VPC as well. So yeah. lots of options even, there. Even even then, try and keep everything in the same AZ, yeah. and uh, because um, because cross AZ traffic. Um, yeah, but S three is a global service, so right. that, that shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a big. <laughs> no, these this is this is. These these make sense no matter if you're using Couchbase or not. Yeah, so I mean these are the things. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, actually, what I'm telling you is is really best practices for managing your AWS account, anyway. <laughs> right, right, but 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 still, it, you know, that was the first thing. It's like, oh wait a minute, this could be like large swaths of data. So 
you you definitely don't want to get that surprise uh, on your on your bill. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so that's Hello. that's all I want to show in the demo. There, if you have more questions, happy to, you know, kind of do it live if you want. But uh, I do have uh, some wrap up slides we can get back to if if there aren't any questions. I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, where is my, here it is. All right, uh, demo's done. All right, they say you only remember three, four things from any given presentation. So here they are. Uh, no SQL doesn't necessarily mean no SQL anymore. Uh, I think I like to think of it more as SQL plus plus is uh, it's taking a different way of storing data as JSON on a distributed database, but still applying SQL as a language to it. SQL++ is basically just SQL with superpowers for JSON and uh, nested data. So it allows you to query any kind, whatever, no matter what the shape of your data is, you can use SQL to query them. And the last thing is, remember those little arrows? Um, those can be expensive and those, those ETLs in there, we wanna minimize those if we can. And we're gonna maximize our SQL knowledge uh, as much as, as possible, because SQL is one of those top three languages. If you want to get deep into some of this stuff, you can hear some of the uh, uh, papers I mentioned early on. So the, the original EFCOD paper, it's a great read. Um, that's, I don't know if that's a good link in the long run, but I, I checked it today, it still works. So you can check it out there. Happy to make these slides available to you, by the way, uh, if, you, if you wanna share them with the group. The free lunch is over, a great paper by Herb Sutter there. And the original SQL paper, I couldn't find a free link for that. So that one's acm.org, you'll have to, you have to get access to that if you want to uh, read that original paper. Uh, UCSD, uh, they used to have a website, uc a forward.ucsd.edu, but I, I checked it today, it's not there anymore. So um, I don't know if the project is over or what, or they moved it to a different URL, um, but you can check that out, UC San Diego. The SQL query language paper, it's hosted there. Uh, I think it's a Cornell website, the uh, arxiv.org. You can go check out the paper there if you want to read that. Don Chamberlain, he's a national treasure, I think. He's uh, written a book, SQL++ for SQL users, available on Amazon. Couchbase has made that free as a PDF if you want to check it out. Go to that link there. And there's a couple of interesting videos that uh, he's in um, talking about NoSQL, uh, evolution of SQL to SQL++, and, and how that works with... Uh, um, with, with Couchbase and, and other, other projects going on there. Uh, you can use me as a resource as well. Uh, I'm on Twitter at mgroves. You can email me at Couchbase. Uh, I usually say people find me after the session in the hallway, but we don't have a hallway. So you can email me or, or tweet me. Uh, some next steps for you. If you want to check out Couchbase, as I said, the beta version is totally free download right now. Uh, Couchbase.com slash downloads. Some free training available. Some of that is analytics, but there's free training for a lot of subjects. Upcoming events like this one are on a calendar there if you want to uh, see else, see what else we're talking about in the future. There's some actually a Gartner Analytics event coming up if you're interested in that. And lots of blogs. That link is just the ones on analytics. So if you want to read more about analytics there or the forms if you have technical questions about it there. I'm seeing some other questions come in chat here. Here's some of the frequently asked questions I get. So if you want to, I can answer these. Question, uh, how do we use SQL++ with existing SQL Server? Is it add-ons or a tool? So I don't think SQL Server supports SQL++ yet. I, I hope they do in the future, but what I, I think the direction they're going is more along the lines of JSON as a data type. Uh, so you'd have kind of like little islands of JSON data in SQL Server. Um, that's, and, and I got a whole different syntax for it. Um, you know, JSON parsing functionality in SQL Server. Now, the way I did it is I just, uh, I, I sort of copied my data from SQL Server into Couchbase. And there's lots of tools out there for that. I'm working on one myself, open source project, but there's other tools out there. You can copy SQL Server data to, to a Couchbase server if you want to. Uh, should GraphQL be explored if accessing SQL++? Um, so GraphQL is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a query language over HTTP a little bit. Uh, I don't, I don't, that's more for like the front end web application type of thing. SQL plus plus, I think is generally speaking, you could use it with the front end. Um, 
you could have a GraphQL query be turned into SQL++ if you wanted to, or turn into regular couch-based SQL uh, language as well. Um, but that, but what I've been covering today is more along the lines of analytics and uh, operational analytics, and not necessarily for front-end web application type of stuff. So if you want to um, expand on that question, happy to discuss it more. Or if you want me to click on any of these links and, and answer these questions, I have pre-prepared slides for them because I get asked them so often. What is the licensing? Licensing, yes. So this has actually changed recently. Uh, there is uh, two versions of Couchbase server. There's community and enterprise. Um, the source code for the community version is open source. So it's, it's BSL is the change we've made recently and it'll revert to Apache 2. Uh, that's free to use anywhere in production. Uh, it only gets forum support for that. Uh, Server Enterprise, actually, uh, for analytics, by the way, uh, is not available in community. Uh, analytics is an enterprise-only feature. Uh, so that uh, most of the source code for that is open source, uh, BSL, Apache 2. I should lowercase those open sources, by the way, if anyone's a stickler for that, sorry. Um, but uh, I will say they are free to download. So if you want to try them out and play with them and just do a proof of concept, uh, they're available on couchbase.com for slash downloads. If you want to get those, also Couchbase Cloud's available out there. If you want to run it in your AWS VPC or your Azure VNet, you can do that as well. There's Kubernetes operators, there's Docker images. You can run Couchbase basically anywhere. Uh, Mac, Linux, Windows, et cetera. For enterprise, if you want to go to production, you need a license for it. And we also offer paid support if you, if you uh, want to go down that realm. And I might defer to Joni. For any deeper questions along those lines, um, because I'm, you know, more of a developer, technical person, not so much into the, into the sales uh, side of things. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, I'm here. And it looks like Lindsay's asking for more entries into the raffle. So if you want to get those in. Uh, just DM her your, looks like uh, full name, business email, company name and title. That is what you're gonna DM to Lindsay. Don't DM it to me. She's the one with the Raspberry Pi, not me. Oh, I put Lindy, sorry about that, Lindy. I meant Lindsay. Uh, if, if you have more questions, happy to take them, but I do wanna say thank you for having me back again. Thank you for having me back again so soon. That is a, I mean, that makes me feel really good about myself that not only would I get invited back, but I get invited back so quickly. So I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, send her a savings account number two. She'll make a, a little, little withdrawal there. Okay, you are welcome. All right, folks. Well, Lindsay, I assume you'll, uh, are you gonna follow up with uh, the people afterwards or, or is that done now? Um, I could do it now so everyone knows it's all on the up and up and totally legit. Oh, Dan Collins won. It's like, how come Dan keeps winning all of these raffles? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, I can share my screen um, if you don't mind. Sorry, don't, I don't mind the toddlers in the background, guys. Um, I can share my screen. Yeah, okay, I'm going to make you co host. And um, let's see. So um, we'll just use these numbers here. So everyone, you're assigned two through six. Okay. Lindsay, it's, it, Lindsay, it's so peaceful there. Sounds very yeah, peaceful. It's so <laughs> peaceful, guys. It's my favorite. <laughs> Have your kids pick. All right. Who was number six? Matt. Matt is our Raspberry Pi starter kit winner. So if you guys want to, um, Matt, if you want to email me, I'm going to put my email in the chat and you can just email me your shipping address and I'll get that out to you as soon as possible. Matt is a famous DevOps uh, meetup participant. I'm glad he got himself a Raspberry Pi. 
very cool uh, piece of technology there. If you've never used it, go get your Raspberry Pi and mess around with it. Sparkfun.org or whatever that is. Okay. Any other uh, closing comments or thoughts? That's pretty cool. Ask a quick question to the audience. Um, are there any topics that are top of mind for you that you guys would love to hear more about from a NoSQL database platform or I don't know where to adopt puppies in Chile, anything like that? Hmm. What puppies? It's also a terrible problem in Portugal. Um, but yeah, I, I will uh, you can feel free to put them in the chat or email us. Um, we can see what else we can pimp out of Matt since he's such an awesome presenter. Maybe he's got some more great content for us. Uh, and I'm happy to, you know, if you're sick of me, I, I, I know a lot of people who have also <laughs> great content that, uh, um, that I, I think you would, uh, enjoy hearing from as well. Yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of thoughts I had as I was watching it. I'll, I'll probably pound out an email or two to there, Matt, talking about topics that I'm interested in. But uh, yeah, any, really any of you can email stuff. me. By the way. <laughs> really neat stuff, though. Okay, yeah. Any other uh, any other thoughts, comments, questions before you shut down the DevOps meetup for April? Okay, all. Well, thank you for joining. Be safe out there, and uh, keep an eye out for the uh, for the calendar. There, we got a lot of great stuff coming up, and of course, you know when we announce for Houston the uh, Houston DevOps days, jump on that and come on out and see us because everything will be back to normal by then. I promise. <laughs> okay. Sweet. Take it easy, guys. Later. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.